Uh, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. We appreciate you being here. It's you know not the greatest weather, and we appreciate you coming out and, and deciding to, to spend your night with us. Uh, my name is Lenore Curell with the United Home Nation, and we've been working in one of the partners with this project. And so I want to, before we get too far, I want to introduce um, a number of people that are here that are also partners working with us. Um, John Silver is our council member here. He represents the Dulac area. And he's with the United Home Nation. With Louisiana Environmental Act Action Network, we have Mary Lee Orr and Mike Orr. With Visco, helping you sign in in the back, is Benita Bodland. And I do want to recognize Dr. Mike. Um, he's been working, and I'm sure we'll have some discussions about this, working on a um, detox project and program in the Raceland area uh, related to the spill. So <coughs> what we wanted to have the opportunity was that this particular project is uh, being funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health, and we are partnering with the University of Texas Medical <coughs> And the, the project has two primary components to it that are related to the oil spill. The one we're focusing specifically on tonight, but we'll give you some information on the second one, is seafood sampling okay. and looking at seafood safety issues and things like that. <coughs> and so these guys have come out, John and Brian, um, right after the spill, started having some discussions with us, and they really wanted to hear feedback of what were we hearing from the community, what were the areas of concern, and, and things like that. And the, the two issues we had were, were <coughs> seafood safe and how is it affecting people's health and things like that. And that's the, the general scope of the project. Um, government does not respond fast. You guys know that. And so the, the National Institute of Environmental Health put out the proposals. That takes a long, a long period of time, and actually, surprisingly, they fast-tracked this, but it still took several months for, for them to make decisions and actually roll out the money to be able to do that. So what, what happened is, is we are you know, close to two years after the spill, and, and we're, we're getting started on moving big portions of this project forward. And so they'll go into more detail of giving you that information. I, I do want to let you know that we have uh, audio, all the audio is being recorded because we want to also have a conversation with you guys. What are you seeing? You know, because it's important that the scientists get that feedback of what do you see? What are the changes? What's new? What's different? And, and, and how does that play into the samples they'll be doing? Um, if you're uncomfortable with that, <coughs> let us know. We'll stop the audio. We want to be real respectful of you. Um, we also have Ms. Darlene Eshte, and she will be videoing and photographing in the back. Um, there are a number of people in the Grand Isle area that want to get the information. They've asked her to come and do that. If you feel uncomfortable and you'd like to ask Ms. Darlene if you have comments, please just raise your hand and say, I'd rather not be recorded. And, and that's no. fine. You know. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to, Ms. to John. Okay. Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming to this. Uh, we're, we're a little late getting here, I realize that. But we want, we want everybody to understand what the project's trying to do, why we're doing it. And as Lenore said, it does take an awful long time to get uh, right on my phone. Okay. <laughs> to get the government to roll out the money, get all the people together to make plans of what to do. And this is a what we call a community-based participatory research project, which means the communities are part of this too. All of our partner groups, and in this area, it's the United Home and Nation, BISCO, and LEAN, and then we have other partners that are in Mississippi and Alabama. This is a pretty big project. And it took a long time to get everything rolling. It is rolling now, though. And I just wanted to point out what you got when you came in, a whole bunch of papers, um, and go over just what they are. This here, it says ATSDR on it, is an explanation of what we're looking for. They're chemicals called PAHs. They're part of crude oil. There's two kinds of them. One of them is made from burning, burning lots of different things, like burning meat, burning oil and diesel, okay? It creates what they call pyrogenic, which just means it came, came out of fire. 
The other kind is called petrogenic, and those are the kind that are just part of the oil. You don't need to do any burning to make them. They're there. <coughs> and this explains a little bit of the health effects of these kinds of things, how you can be exposed to them and what that exposure might do. And uh, it's not to scare anybody because we don't have any data that shows anything to be scared about. But uh, this is just so you know what it is we're looking for. The next thing, it says marine life sample collection procedures. And this, I don't know if you want to read all this, but it's just a breakdown of how we collect oysters, shrimp, white and brown, different fin fish. Right now we're looking at speckled trout, so we're thinking of expanding that, and oysters. And it explains how you do it, how we do it. And we've been doing it on boats with people. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting for us because we don't do that for a living. And, but we got to go with fishermen to find out where the things are, you know, and things that they have seen and they can point that out to us. And that's the community involvement part of this. <laughs> then over here, this is just pictures of the slideshow I'm going to do. And some, some lines if you want to write something after a slide, you can. But, it, you know, this is just something to take home. And, and you want to remember something, look at it again. I just want to give you a record of it. And this one here is about the second part of the study. And this is not about seafood, this is about people. And we, we will be trying to enroll people in a study that will ask you some questions about health effects you might be feeling since the spill. And these are a variety of different health effects, physical, psychological, all kinds of things. And also, how it's affected your local personal economy. And also, we'll be taking some blood and urine samples to see if those PAHs are in people as well as in seafood. What we're trying to do is establish the exposure source, which might be eating, and what's happening when people eat it. Okay. And uh, the other thing is the agenda. This is what we're going to cover. So I just wanted to make sure this was all covered so you knew why you got those papers. Because a lot of times people pass stuff out and then, you know, that's no, nothing's ever said about it. But I wanted, wanted you to know what it was. And it is important. We really like you to be able to refer to it. Okay? And I'm going to introduce Roma Super now. She's going to talk about a study she did, a series of studies after the spill. That was the inspiration for what the bigger study is. It really came right out of her work. So this is one more. Thank you, John. My name is Wilma Subra, and I provide technical assistance to community groups dealing with environmental issues. I provide technical assistance to Louisiana Environmental Action Network, and Mary Lee Orr is the <coughs> executive director of LEAN. So here you see, this is a study that was performed by myself by Paul Moore, who is the Lower Mississippi River Keeper, meaning he deals with the Lower Mississippi River, basically in Louisiana, <coughs> some up above, states above Louisiana, all the way into the Gulf. And then the third partner doing this work is Michael Orr. Michael, stand up. And he's also with me. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is just a tiny slice <coughs> of the work that Lean has done in response to the BP spill. What we're going to talk about is the sampling of the sediment, the soil, and the tissue. Lee has done a huge amount of work in addition to this, but tonight's focus is on soil, sediment, and tissue. So what did we sample as a result of the BP spill? We sampled soil and sediment. We sampled vegetation. All vegetation on the surface, subsurface vegetation out of the marshy areas. And then we sampled the tissue consisting of shrimp, oysters, crabs, mussels, snails, and thin fish. And John took all of what we did and used it as the basis for the project, which he gave <coughs> the name is Juicy Marm. And so his project will include sampling of shrimp, oysters, crabs, and thin fish. And then we also did blood samples on individuals who were exposed, and Dr. Mike Robichaud collected a lot of those blood samples for us 
and bring them all to a lab in Georgia to have them analyzed. So this is me looking like a crawfish. When I go out, I have to stay as much covered up as possible. And here I'm actually collecting soil, and it's more like soil sediment mixed together as one of the locations that we sampled. And this one was down at the mouth of the Mississippi River. So what did we analyze the soil sediment tissue samples for? We analyzed them for oil range organic, which are petroleum hydrocarbons, sort of like the oily substance in them. And then we analyzed it for alkylated polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons. So that is the form John held up from Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry. And you can hear us talk over and over again about polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. It was a large component of the Louisiana sweet crude that BP spilled into the Gulf that migrated onto the shore. And it is also very long lasting in the environment. So when we're doing this study for the University of Texas Medical Branch, we need to be able to analyze the substances that will be around for a long time and so we can track how those substances behave in the environment. So that's why we picked the polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons and that's what we also analyzed for in the tissues we did beginning at, right after the spill. And then we also looked at the dispersants. And you, as you know, there were two types of dispersants that we used to sink the oil and we looked at those as well. Then we looked for toxic heavy metals and we found some but not nearly enough to warrant continuing to look for the heavy metals. And then in the human blood samples, some of which Dr. Mike Robichaud collected, we looked for volatile organic which were like benzene, toluene, xylene. These are the things like if your daughter opens a bottle of fingernail polish remover in the house, you smell it all over the house. It's volatile. It is easily released into the air. And so that's what we look for in the human blood samples. <coughs> so we're going to talk now about what are the results of the samples that myself and Michael and Paul collected. And the results of the ones that we did, the soil and sediment in the wetlands and the ecosystem of just Louisiana, we're presenting the data tonight of just Louisiana. And we sampled these soil sediments from Atchafalaya Bay all the way eastward to the Louisiana-Mississippi state line. Again, from Atchafalaya Bay eastward to the Louisiana-Mississippi state line and we're doing just Louisiana data tonight. So when we analyzed these samples of the soil and sediment, we found from six to 89 individual PAHs. And they corresponded to what we call fingerprint. They corresponded to the pattern you get if you had a sample of BP crude. We had samples early on in the process of the BP crude, and then BP pulled all those samples back but we have the fingerprint, and when we analyze the soil and the sediment, it actually matched. You could lay one over the other, and they matched. So it was BP crude we were analyzing. And then the oil range.